good afternoon. On behalf of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis, I am delighted once again to welcome you all this time to the third and final afternoon in our inaugural Danforth Distinguished Lectures, featuring Professor David A. Hollinger in conversation with Professors John Butler, Darren Dochuk, and Molly Worthen on the subject of Protestant foreign missions and secularization in modern America. I'm Marie Griffith, the Danforth Center Director, and uh, just, I just want to reiterate what a wonderful week this has been. On Monday, we heard Professor Hollinger describe and analyze the astonishing impact of Protestant foreign missionaries and their grown children, what in my background we used to call MKs for missionary kids, uh, their grown children, the impact that they had on important movements within the United States, such as civil rights and various movements uh, against racism and, and many other movements as well. Yesterday we heard three outstanding responses to that first lecture that pushed Professor Hollinger in some different directions and toward greater analytic clarity on several key points. And today we will hear from Professor Hollinger in his last lecture of this series. Um, I speak for all of us uh, faculty and staff at the Danforth Center on Religion and Politics to say we are deeply grateful to him and to all who have traveled far and wide to be here for this week's exciting events. Multi-day lecture series like this one can be quite intense for both the body and soul and mind, uh, but they are well worth the output of time and energy for the sustained analytic discussion and insight that they provide. So we're very thankful uh, for that this week. I want to stress again today, as I have on prior days, our deep appreciation to the Danforth Foundation to Senator John C. Danforth, and to our National Advisory Board member, Mary Danforth Stillman, for their extraordinary generosity in establishing the center and these Danforth Distinguished Lectures whose tradition begins this week. I am especially grateful to Jack and to Mary for their ongoing public and private support of the wide array of center activities and publications that we sponsor. I'm delighted now to introduce another key player within the Danforth Center to introduce Professor Hollinger, and that is Rachel Lindsay, our newly hired associate director, who is doing splendid work in organizing our curriculum and our many efforts to reach the student population at Washington University, and indeed, students at various levels of achievement throughout the country. We're very fortunate to have her on this campus and in our center. Rachel. Good evening. Uh, before I turn to introduce Professor Hollinger, uh, there is one other person in this room whose recognition is long overdue this week. For months, and indeed for years at this point, Marie Griffith has been hard at work orchestrating this week's event. Um, don't let her feisty spirit and academic brilliance deflect the sheer amount of work that has gone into making this week happen. Um, in addition to making this week happen, she's also been hard at work building the center since her appointment in 2011, and without which none of this would have been able to, um, to occur this week. So please, please um, join me in thanking her for her uh, tremendous contribution. Over the last two days, many of us in this room have, had, have learned a great deal from Professor Hollinger, and it may seem as though by reputation and now by familiarity, he needs no introduction. Rest assured, my comments will be, and my remarks will be very brief. But I also wanna take this opportunity to underscore a point that has been made by Professor Schmidt and P P Professor Maffley Kipp. We have barely scratched the surface of Professor Hollinger's compendious contributions to humanistic inquiry. As an inaugural distinguished lecturer for a new center still in the process of gathering its bearings, I can think of no other scholar who better embodies the spirit of the Danforth Center on religion and politics. This is a sentiment that has been articulated many times this week, 
but it is one worth repeating. As we have seen in his lecture on Monday, his substantive response yesterday, and as we will hear again tonight, Professor Hollinger is a model for this series, not only for the answers he provides, but for the questions he continues to pose. As a graduate student earlier, and now as a junior scholar, this is the model uh, that has captured my own vocational aspirations, and no doubt those of many of you tonight. The questions that Professor Hollinger asks cut to the quick of American life in both its most intimate instances and its most public expressions. And apropos for this setting, the questions that he asks are precisely those that a center on religion and politics should be prepared to engage. It would be a helpful exercise, no doubt, to comb through Professor Hollinger's extensive bibliography and catalog these cutting questions with which he persistently battles. I will leave that momentous task to another day. But I will raise one question, and it happens to be the first of his that I remember encountering as a graduate student before reading more deeply into his by then prodigious paper trail. In the 2003 American Historical Review Forum, Professor Hollinger asked this question. To what extent are the borders between communities of descent to be maintained and why? To what extent are the borders between communities of descent to be maintained and why? Professor Hollinger's commitment to probe beyond the surface of facts to the substance of ideas is on full display in this question. And the pursuit of its answer has led him to think deeply about the legacies of social, economic, ethnic, and religious inheritance in American public life. And if the most immediate context of the question is in fact to change ideas about ethnicity and race by changing the ways in which we speak and think about them, in contentious times like our own, the question can also be posed in thinking about the divisive, divisiveness of politics and the splintering of religion. If politics and religion do not always carry the visual signifiers associated with other categories of affiliation, although they often do, the question of categorical integrity and maintenance are certainly within the scope of this center's curricular research and public interests. In a word, perhaps allowing the kindling of this week to speak unguarded, Professor Hollinger has been Emersonian, a scholar and an American fully of his time and yet always seeking the better angels of ourselves and our vocation. Professor Hollinger, thank you. So another marvelous uh, introduction, uh, which is consistent with my experience here the last 48 hours uh, in that, well, and really longer than that, but 48 hours ago when uh, I was lecturing here on Monday, I commented on uh, the things about the Danforth Center that I so much appreciated. <clears throat> and I can now add to that, that all my experiences since then have showed me uh, what a classy outfit this is. I mean, from the point of view of minute-to-minute -minute organization and making sure that everything works right to uh, a, a nice uh, rhythm of activities and wonderful people to talk to and <clears throat> a very high level of, of, of professionalism and intellectual engagement and, uh, and, and, and personal sensitivity. So I really appreciate all those things. So uh, the American missionary to China, <clears throat> Frank Rawlinson, I observed uh, toward the end of my lecture on Monday, was a vivid example of how American experience in the mission field among foreign peoples could change someone in directions that called into question not only the ethnocentric ideas driving the missionary project, but even the missionary enterprise itself and the ultimate value of Christianity. Rawlinson was killed before he had a chance to resolve his doubts but his more famous contemporary, whom we've talked about a lot, Pearl Buck, uh, <clears throat> survived and migrated out of Presbyterianism to live what I think it is fair to call a post-Protestant life. By which I mean that Buck no longer affiliated herself with her ancestral Pre Presbyterian church, no longer justified worldly actions with reference to any specifically Christian imperative, but in her secular life, she showed the marks of her Protestant past. The values displayed in her fiction 
and in her service activities, especially her work in promoting the adoption of Americans of uh, the, the adoption by Americans of mixed race children fathered by black servicemen in Korea, then rejected by Korean society. Uh, Buck spent many of her later years orchestrating programs for transracial adoption and international uh, adoption. I'm saying that the activity there is one of many things she did that seems to me traceable to the kind of liberal Protestant origins that she had. Now, not all missionaries and missionary children followed this kind of trajectory, but so many of them became conspicuously liberal, if not secular, that this whole saga of the Protestant boomerang offers an especially compelling invitation to engage what, for lack of a better term, we call secularization. <clears throat> In the last 10 minutes of my lecture on Monday, I sketched out what seemed to me to be the place of that saga in this secularization process. But just what is meant by secularization and just how widespread it has become are of course hotly contested questions in our own time. Today I want to move beyond the missionary project as such, although I will be referring back to it from time to time, in order to jump right in the middle of the controversies about secularization theory, uh, into which this research project on the missionaries and my recent book, After Cloven Tongues of Fire, have thrust me, not altogether willingly, by the sheer logic of the vocabulary and the conceptual apparatus that uh, have been available to me in the existing scholarly literature. The destiny of Christianity in the United States <clears throat> has proved to be the most persistently vexing uncertainty within the entire secularization debate, which has emerged as one of the most far-ranging and high-stakes controversies within the humanities and social sciences of the last 50 years. Is the most Christianity-affirming society in the industrialized world an example of American exceptionalism, as many now insist? Or is the vaunted secularity of Western Europe the exception to a rule of ongoing religious affiliation that applies to the United States and to the global South? After all, <clears throat> Christianity is growing at a ferocious pace in much of Africa, many parts of Latin America and Asia. Peter Berger, who in the 1960s himself espouse the decline of religion emphasis in mainstream secularization theory, uh, declared, Peter Berger declared by the end of the 1990s that this theory was essentially mistaken and so egregiously wrong-headed as to make what is really difficult to understand nowadays is not Iranian mullahs but American professors. So the discrediting <clears throat> of secularization theory has become one of the most popular of academic and journalistic routines, conveying to readers and authors up-to-date aloofness from those secular triumphalists who saw religion disappearing with the advancement of the modernization process. The coming of a post-secular world is heralded amid, amid confident dismissals of the old 20th century intelligentsia's lingering enlightenment conceits. Although sociologists are uniquely prominent in debating what one of their number, Jose Casanova, <clears throat> calls the great impasse in the secularization debate, that classic secularization theory works well for Europe but not for the United States. This debate attracts also historians, anthropologists, theologians, political scientists, philosophers, and scholars of religious studies. By addressing the destiny of one religion in one country, historians can bracket the more general controversies about what is genuinely religious, not contesting the now popular assertion that the very distinction between the religious and the secular is a peculiarity of the North Atlantic West and is of almost no utility for studying Islam or Buddhism or other varieties of faith. This point, has, this point has been made by Talal Assad and his followers with increasing conviction and acceptance in the last decade. But this use of brackets, leaving aside the utility of classical secularization theory for dealing with Hinduism, for example, 
does not remove historians altogether from the larger social theoretical debates. Explanation and prediction do constitute a logical syndrome, after all, so historians should not shrink in horror from the prospect that our findings about a discrete patch of history will be deployed by sociologists to improve the most general of their theories, just as we historians explore our particular domains, instructed at least heuristically, by the species-wide hypotheses of social theorists. Perhaps those of you who share my appreciation and admiration for uh, William H. Sewell Jr.'s book, The Logics of History, <clears throat> which I think is the best work of historical social theory in the last 50 years, will agree, I hope, that historians have much more to contribute to the formulation and testing of social theoretical generalizations than is often recognized by social theorists and historians alike. I believe that the fate of Christianity as a cultural project in the United States, once properly understood, supports rather than undermines the essentials of secularization theory as developed in the 1960s on the basis of neglected insights of Emil Durkheim and Max Weber. According to that theory, a dependence on supernatural authority and the institutions ostensibly authorized by it, a dependence once widespread, gradually diminished in response to the major social transformations of the industrial era, especially the movement of populations from rural countryside to diverse urban environments, the advancement of science and literacy, and the diminution of physical insecurity, and the strengthening of democratic political institutions facilitating the social empowerment of larger populations. All of these things happened in the United States <clears throat> and with religious consequences that have largely escaped notice because of a failure to distinguish between the liberalized styles of Christianity that have most persisted in the United States and the more orthodox styles that inspired secularization theory to begin with and dictated that body of theory's standard measurements of secularity. Those measurements do well enough even now for a substantial segment of the American population, especially that affiliated with evangelical Protestantism, but those measurements do not do so well for the rest of a Catholic and Protestant populace that is gradually incorporated into itself many of the enlightenment sensibilities that students of secularization usually recognize only when they are full blown as proclaimed unbelief. There's cause to wonder <clears throat> if this whole inquiry about secularization would have proceeded as it has, if Christianity in 1500 or 1700 or even 1900 was what has been recently affirmed in that name by liberal Catholics and liberal Protestants in the United States. What indeed are we trying to measure and why? I will argue that a valid understanding of American history vindicates the basic insights of classical secularization theory, invites that theory's use as an instrument for explaining Christianity's American fate as it has actually unfolded, and compels a recognition, uh, c compels a reconsideration, compels a reconsideration of the classic metrics and vocabulary of social science when it studies Christianity. So just how could Christianity flourish in the United States even while demonstrably experiencing the transforming social conditions that secularization theorists of the 1960s found central to Christianity's declining appeal to populations in Western Europe? Several deeply structural uh, demographic and constitutional peculiarities mitigated the effect of the mechanisms that had a greater influence in Europe. As I summarize these peculiarities in the next few minutes, I believe most of you will find them quite obvious once stated. But here's the thing. These features of American history are strikingly undeveloped in the writings of the chief defenders of secularization theory, including Bruce and Norris and Boaz, and are engaged only elliptically by those theorists who use the United States as a basis for declaring secularization theory dead. 
Hence, it matters to bring aspects of American history, even if familiar to many of us gathered here, into conversation with the social scientists. What peculiarities of American history do I think are so pertinent? <clears throat> the nation began and long remained demographically dominated by Protestant dissenters who defined themselves against a variety of European establishments, Anglican and Lutheran, as well as Roman Catholics. These dissenting Protestants easily achieved strong class position and the, in the political and social vacuum of a settler society, coming into a measure of control over public affairs that endured well into the 20th century. The United States was largely theirs for the taking, and they took it. These Congregationalists, Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, Quakers, Huguenots, and a multitude of Anabaptist pietist confessions flourished under a constitutional regime of church-state separation that facilitated the growth of religiously defined voluntary societies. The disestablishment of churches in one state after another, Massachusetts in 1833 was the last, renouncing in that year the uses of tax money to support the Congregationalists, can be counted as a type of secularization, to be sure, comparable to the federal constitution's First Amendment and to that constitution's omission of any reference to God, anomalous in the governance cultures of the Christian West of that our era. But this institutional autonomy liberated religion to become a set of dispositions and institutions that would otherwise have been less possible. Above all, this measure of separation allowed religiously defined affiliations to perform the classic role of voluntary associations in civil society much more readily than churches could perform this function in countries where religion remained part of the state. Church-state separation may not promote this result in all possible circumstances, but here in the absence of other institutions and amid a unique array of diverse religious heritages heavily influenced by more intensely religious than thou cultural origins of the dissenting sects, the American denominational order became firmly established. The 19th century <clears throat> became the epoch of massive church expansion not only for the traditional European origin groups, but also for newer fellowships native to America, above all the disciples of Christ and the Mormons. To this denominational order, <clears throat> the Episcopalians and a variety of Lutheran bodies adjusted quite easily. Immigrants from Catholic countries also turned to their own religion as a vital solidarity mediating between the kinship group and the larger society run by Protestants often extremely hostile to Catholics. Large-scale immigration by Protestants as well as Catholics, moreover, provided a constant supply of people in special need of intermediate solidarities. Populations born with a proprietary relation to a land and its national institutions feel this need less acutely. <clears throat> the social, psychological condition of an immigrant receiving society where a demand for intimacy and belonging is especially intense is thus a crucial part of Christianity's American fate. The ironically church-promoting consequences of secularizing disestablishment in the various states were thus all the more pronounced and helped distinguish the United States from immigrant receiving countries lacking this separation. Even Protestant emigres from Northern Europe in the great migration that ended in the 1920s faced social circumstances very different from kin who continued in, to live in more homogeneous, less mobile societies such as Germany, Sweden, Denmark, the Netherlands, England, Scotland. The denominational order of the United States was thus heavily ethnic in character as the sadly undervalued Timothy L. Smith used to insist reflecting the immigrant origins of the predominantly Scottish and Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, the Dutch Reformed as a separate from the German Reform, the various Lutheran synods defined by several Scandinavian and German antecedents, the persistently English stock of the Congregationalists and the Episcopalians, and the de facto division of Catholic parishes along Polish, Italian, Irish, and other ethnic lines. 
No doubt many Americans, <clears throat> like many Europeans, had non-Durkheimian reasons for religious affiliation, fear of death, the aesthetic appeal of the mass. But this solidarity providing function goes a long way toward explaining the greater attraction of churches in the immigrant receiving society of the United States. These peculiarities of American history <clears throat> affected not only the populace, but also the most highly educated of inhabitants. America, in America, the Enlightenment itself, <clears throat> as Henry May demonstrated in a landmark book of 1976, took a relatively church-friendly form. Ideas aggressively skeptical of Christianity were far from widespread in a nation of extensive investment in Christian communities, even among the learned in the generation of Thomas Jefferson. Throughout the 19th century, moreover, American thinkers were more eager than their European counterparts to find science and religion to be harmonious. These thinkers experienced deeper and more abiding concerns about evolutionary science and about <clears throat> historicist biblical scholarship. Here I have Benjamin Jowett up there with Darwin. It's a, always a source of uh, amazement to me that uh, so few people, uh, like the students that I teach, understand that in the 1860s, when Jowett made his arguments about the higher criticism, this was incalculably a bigger thing than the Darwinian Revolution. So the Darwinian Revolution is always stressed by secular historians, but anybody who knows anything about the history of religion realizes that the higher criticism was an enormous thing. So Jowett's writings of 1860 uh, outsold Darwin like a hundred times during the immediate years uh, right afterward. Anyway, most, uh, most scientists, scholars, and writers in the United States came to accept the Darwinian revolution in natural history and the higher criticisms embedding of the Bible in the dynamics of human history, even while gingerly dealing with a public whose religiously based resistance threatened to block the advancement of inquiry and the dissemination of its results. The constitutional arrangements of most Protestant denominations built from this dissenting matrix endowed the people in the pew with enormous power, with the result that preachers and professors at church-related colleges and seminaries could not get too far out in front of their constituencies without endangering their standing as leaders. Ministers very often withheld from their parishioners what they had learned in German periodicals about the multiple authorship of Isaiah, the questionable status of the book of John, and the fact that many of Paul's epistles were not written by Paul at all. The development of the modern university <clears throat> as a non-sectarian institution in the last third of the 19th century provided a special institutional space for American careers running on the same discursive tracks traveled by scholars and scientists in England, Germany, and France. But even in that space, <clears throat> a generic Protestantism represented by the, well represented by the Cornell president, uh, Andrew Dixon White, an Episcopalian whose iconic warfare of science with theology took place within Christendom, continued to infuse the public culture of these campuses well into the 20th century. Even through World War II, the massive reluctance of most of the nation's ostensibly secular universities to hire Jewish professors in the social scientific and humanities fields attested to how firmly in place were the breaks on de-Christianization. Scientific knowledge did its demystifying work in the minds of those Americans most touched by it, but the bulk of Americans were able to ignore it. The popular antagonism toward Darwinism developed only in the early 1920s when the expansion of high school education brought millions of American families who had been largely oblivious to evolutionary science into direct contact with it for the very first time. Once stated, these facts about American history do seem obvious enough <clears throat> and make it possible to see how the United States could be subject to the same social transformations experienced elsewhere while retaining a greater involvement with Christianity. Yet, even the most recent writings by some of the most resolute defenders of secularization theory fail to mobilize these truths effectively. If only these sociologists knew more American history, they could better defend their own ideas. Now, historians might have been of greater help to secularization theorists of the 1960s and after, 
had their successors um, been, had, had these uh, historians, had these historians been more engaged with the questions that were relevant to the inquiry? But the attention of historians was primarily elsewhere. My own tribe of intellectual historians focused for the most part on elites and studied the gradual diminution of the authority of Christianity from Puritan times through the middle of the 20th century, Perry Miller and Bruce Kucklick and all that, while our colleagues, the social and political historians, were often tempted to treat religion as epiphenomenal and were largely oblivious to the persistence of religion into the 20th century, especially after the Scopes trial of 1925. <clears throat> Scholarship or the religious history of the populace in 20th century America, Catholic and Protestant, was chiefly a thing apart, practiced in seminaries and in church-related institutions and journals with very little impact on the history profession. Eventually, however, John Butler's 1990 monograph, A Wash in a Sea of Faith, convinced historians generally that the 19th century was a period of religious intensification rather than decline, and that the United States was much more a Christianity-affirming, church-going society at the start of the 20th century than it had been at the end of the 18th. Even historians slow to absorb Butler's social history breakthrough were struck at about the same time <clears throat> by the prodigious influence of evangelical Protestantism in American politics from the 1980s onward, leading to the much greater attention to modern American religious history characteristic of the history profession in recent years. For the first 104 years of the Organization of American Historians, no president of that body had devoted his or her presidential address to a religious history topic until 2011 when I had the honor of breaking the anti-religious barrier. It took a flaming atheist to do it. Uh, my wife says that I've become the Richard Nixon of my set. <clears throat> but there's much more to Christianity's American fate <clears throat> than the retarding effort of demographic and constitutional circumstances on the growth of atheism or indifference. The specific kinds of Christianity that have persisted in the United States should be taken into account. More and more of the nation's professing Christians, especially in the last several decades, have espoused liberalized versions of the faith that downplay supernaturalism, doubt biblical inerrancy, display tolerance and even respect for other religions, and look to non-religious authorities for guidance on how to live much of their lives. The importance of these liberal, ecumenical, and sometimes casual styles of Christianity was flagged as internal secularization by sociologist Thomas Luckman as early as 1967 and addressed more extensively and perspicaciously in 1993 by another sociologist, uh, Mark Chaves. But the significance of liberalized versions of Christianity is routinely overlooked amid the flurry of attention won by politically and culturally aggressive evangelical Protestants. Scholars who cite the American case as a sign that secularization is simply not happening are especially prone to downplay the distinction between orthodoxy and the styles of religious affirmation that lack sectarian exclusivity and claims to universality. They count everyone. Yet there's a striking empirical cont uh, continuum, <clears throat> the conditions that, according to secularization theory, encourage a migration out of Christianity altogether, also promote the adoption of less absolutist and orthodox versions of the faith. Some of the most prominently proclaimed and defended versions of Christianity are quite different from the varieties that generated the inquiry of secularization theorists to begin with. Three of the most widely discussed American religious thinkers of the 20th century can illustrate this highly salient feature of the history of American Christianity. William James is one of, if not the most important theorist of Protestantism's relation to modernity. 
One textbook on the history of American Protestantism divides the entire saga into pre-James and post-James periods. James gained vast popular appeal as the philosopher who saved religion from the apparent threats emanating from science. Indeed, his <clears throat> The Varieties of Religious Experience remains after more than a century one of the most respected scholarly studies of religion ever written in the English language. Yet neither in this great book, nor even in his more widely heralded essay, The Will to Believe, does James defend a single Christian doctrine. James's sense of the religious was general in the extreme, but its persistent abstractness was obscured for many readers by the concreteness of his specific examples of religious experience and by the polemical edge of his attacks on secular zealotry. Theologians and religious studies scholars sometimes cling to James like a life preserver, the great thinker who saw through the secular conceits that remain an annoyance even today. The literature on secularization, however, almost never mentions James. What he did was to make religion safe for science-educated Christians by removing from it anything more specific than a virtually undefined theism and enabling them to project their own particular faith onto James's defense of religion in general. The patterns of thought, <clears throat> even among James's followers, among theologians, show that the Protestantism defended in James's name was at the outer edge of religious liberalism, sometimes proclaimed as Gary Dorian's exhaustive scholarship has established with no supernaturalism whatsoever. Reinhold Niebuhr <clears throat> was among James's admirers, but the introduction to his own edition of the varieties, Niebuhr cautioned that James had entirely ignored the institutional aspect of religious experience. Niebuhr was understandably worried about the radical separation of individual mystic experiences from the churches designed to enable such experience and to clarify their implications for worldly actions. What kinds of religion could possibly survive without institutionalization? Yet Niebuhr's own career also served to enable styles of Christianity easily merged with secular worldviews. Niebuhr gutted traditional Christian ethics by denying that even the Sermon on the Mount could help one decide how to act in the world, and he vociferously condemned such claims when advanced against the violence carried out by working class revolutionaries and by the armies of the United States. If James made science safe for American Christians, Niebuhr made war safe for them. Niebuhr <clears throat> Uh, refuted pacifism's claims to any kind of compelling New Testament warrant. Moreover, Niebuhr focused his efforts in the 1940s and 50s on articulating a Christian view of human nature that was easily congruent with contemporary secular meditations on paradox, irony, and tragedy, such as those voiced in the fiction of Robert Penn Warren and James Gould Cousins. Even his more conservative brother, H. Richard Niebuhr, chided him for justifying Christianity in terms of its functions in advancing American democracy. Niebuhr never tired of castigating secularists, but among his major historic functions was to advance a version of Christianity easily abandoned by those in his milieu who shared his social values and political agendas. That Christians could get along without any God talk at all and should focus instead on the worldly mission of liberating the captives became explicit in the 1960s in the writing of another popular theologian, Harvey Cox, <clears throat> in the secular city, the now legendary treatise of 1965, Cox celebrated secularization as a liberation from all supernatural myths and sacred symbols. Like the Anglican Bishop John A.T. Robinson and other figures associated with the death of God theologies of the period, Cox spoke for and to Protestantism's educated elite. Although Cox continued to espouse his own versions of Christianity and does so to this day as the emeritus occupant of the oldest academic chair in all of American higher education, the Hollis Professorship of Divinity at Harvard, his major influence appears to have been rendering many sons and daughters of Protestantism more comfortable with finding their way in life without religious affiliations. And comfortable in secularism they proved to be. 
in unprecedented numbers. From the 1960s onward, young people born into the so-called mainline churches, especially the Methodists, the Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Northern Baptist disciples, some of the Lutheran bodies, United Church of Christ, departed in droves <clears throat> and in most cases did not affiliate religiously at all. But this outward migration, while a vital episode in Christianity's American fate, is only one of a number of post-60s developments that need to be confronted together. Many recent sociological studies illuminate these developments and helpfully, helpfully supplement the work of historians. More specifically, what do these studies tell us about the course of American Christianity since the 1960s? The percentage of Americans <clears throat> declaring that they have no religious affiliation has increased sharply, now constituting about one-fifth of the national population. Not all of the unaffiliated declare themselves to be without religious belief, to be sure, and atheism itself remains highly stigmatized. But demographers have been struck by the rapid growth of the number of proclaimed nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which is the preferred social scientific label for the people who, when they are asked to state their religion, say none. So these are not the kind of nuns you find in the Mary Knoll sisters. As late as 1990, <clears throat> the unaffiliated, as measured by the most reliable source of data, the General, uh, General Social Survey, 1990, only 8% of Americans said they had no religious affiliation. This percentage jumped to 15% in 2000, and reached 20% in 2012. Although these non-churched Americans were socially located across all classes and demographic groups, differentials by age and ideology were found to be huge. More than one-third of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 profess no religious affiliation, and while only 9% of political conservatives were without religious affiliation, 40% of political liberals were unaffiliated religiously. Data on church attendance is also pertinent. <clears throat> About 40% of Americans still claim to attend church every week, trying to keep alive, uh, helping to keep alive the image of American religiosity, but only 25% actually do it. The popular, the popular inflation of religious faith and involvement is now extensively documented. Many people feel uncomfortable about how rarely, uh, admitting how rarely they attend church. And this fact renders all the more noteworthy the increase in the numbers of people who are willing to tell survey researchers that they never attend church. This percentage was 13% in 1990, but it reached 22% by 2008. Two of the most methodologically rigorous of demographers, my Berkeley colleagues Michael Howd and Claude Fisher, both resolutely faith-affirming if that matters, report that the key trend in attendance over the last half century or more has been the decline in Catholic attendance to the level of that of mainline Protestants. Those who do attend church the most regularly <clears throat> are the evangelical Protestants who have the most conservative political and theological views even within evangelical Protestantism. Church attendance, once widespread among Americans of a variety of religious orientations, is increasingly concentrated among a narrow and politically conspicuous segment of the Christianity-affirming population of the country. If it is a prominent feature of American popular culture to want to be understood as being somehow or other religious or at least spiritual, thus producing inflated church attendance figures and routinely disparaging atheists, it follows that sociological studies of belief are more difficult to design and execute than are studies of membership or attendance. Yet responses to both the general social survey <clears throat> and the Gallup poll show a steady and clear decline in belief in the Bible's inerrancy understood as the Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally word for word. In the, the mid-1970s, about 40% of respondents still affirmed this belief in biblical inerrancy, while the early years of the 21st century only 30% did. Educational level proved to be a decisive predictor 
College graduates of any institution rarely affirmed biblical inerrancy, which remained the most appealing to Americans with the least education. But one feature of religious belief is massively supported by an abundance of survey research. <clears throat> most religiously affirming Americans now believe that their own faith is not the only path to salvation. This was a major finding of American Grace, How Religion Divides and Unites Us, the massive book of 2010 by Robert D. Putnam and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> Jay and David E. Campbell. This book established that the bulk of American Protestants and Catholics are quite easy about the religious diversity of their country and are anything but sectarian in matters of faith. Putnam and Campbell concluded that Americans are increasingly concentrated at two opposite ends of the religious spectrum, the highly religious and the avowedly secular. The most intensely religious <clears throat> are overwhelmingly white evangelical Protestants and Hispanic Catholics, but also include most African American Protestants and most Mormons. The rest of the spectrum, short of the secular extreme, is inhabited by people whom Putnam and Campbell call moderately religious. These religious moderates are highly tolerant of those with other faiths and are distinguished above all by the ease and frequency with which they switch their affiliations from one church and even one religion to another. Putnam himself likes to broadcast that he's a convert from Methodism to Judaism. This formidable middle, roughly 60% of the American population, as Putnam and Campbell understand it, does include a good many who identify themselves as evangelicals, but much more striking is the fact that located there among the religious moderates are nearly all of the non-Hispanic Catholics, virtually all of the ecumenical Protestants, and the overwhelming majority of religiously affirming Jews. These millions affirm their faith but ascribe to it much more limited authority over their lives than is ascribed to it by the 20% who are religiously intense. The individuals and groups American Grace characterizes as the most religious <clears throat> are those who are the most socially enclosed, interacting more exclusively with birds of their own theological feather, devoted to homeschooling and other devices for keeping modernity at a distance. Putnam and Campbell's widely discussed analysis is consistent with that offered by Mark Shave's more succinct <coughs> and lucid book, American Religion Contemporary Trends. Shaves insists that it is a serious mistake to suppose that liberal ideas are in decline within the ranks of Christian believers. This is an especially important finding in view of the extensive attention paid to the growth of theologically conservative evangelical Protestantism. That growth has been real, Shaves agrees, but like Putnam and Campbell, Shaves places it in a national context and finds even that a substantial portion of self-identified born-again Christians and answer certain key questions in the same way that ecumenical mainline Methodists and Presbyterians do. These born-again Christians, like the average Methodist, will endorse theological liberalism's core beliefs, will outspokenly appreciate other religions, will revise their traditional belief and practice to take account of modern circumstances and reject biblical literalism. There does exist a substantial and politically influential group which affirms traditional beliefs, holds to inerrancy, uh, attends church every Sunday, but, <clears throat> uh, but Shaves warns that if we focus only on that group, we will misunderstand the historic direction of American Christianity. Shaves, a professor of divinity at Duke, who assures me that he attends church every Sunday, <clears throat> goes on to insist in his own italicized summary that no indicator of traditional belief or practice is going up. And he adds that all the signs of social science point to change in the direction of less religion in the United States. In a yet more recent interpretation of the entirety of survey research on American religion over the course of the last 50 years, Shaves and his free-thinking British collaborator David Voaz conclude 
that the gradual diminution of the authority of, of Christianity in the United States is now so pronounced as to largely eliminate the apparent gap between the American and Western European cases so celebrated by Casanova and Berger. Helpful <clears throat> as these recent sociological studies are in establishing the diminution of traditional Christian practices and beliefs since the 1960s, these studies rarely ask what I and I think most historians would say is a vital question. Exactly what kinds of education have been experienced by the individuals being surveyed? What sorts of knowledge about the world do they actually possess? Putnam and Campbell casually allow that educational level does not vary significantly by, very, by religious orientation, but they fail to make distinctions that could substantially diminish the truth value of their claim. The existing surveys usually inquire simply if a respondent was a college graduate or not, <clears throat> or if she, he or she attended college at all, at least for a while, lost from view in the preponderance of social science research are differences in the educational experience between graduates of Wheaton, Biola, Liberty, or Oral Roberts on the one hand, and on the other, graduates of Chicago, Harvard, Swarthmore, or Oberlin. <clears throat> Someone majoring in chemical engineering or nursing or theology, moreover, <clears throat> might differ in religious perspectives from someone who majored in biology, history, English, or sociology. A question that could elicit the same answer from Harvey Cox, University of Pennsylvania graduate, or from James Dobson, Point Loma Nazarene University, does not tell us very much. Did you graduate from college? Do you attend church every week? Do you believe in God? Yes, yes, yes. Each could answer confidently. No wonder so many sociologists express doubt that religion has much that education, excuse me, no wonder so many sociologists express doubt that education has much of an impact on religion. The few studies that do distinguish between types of colleges find that, higher that if higher education includes ample exposure to secular science and scholarship, students drift toward liberal theological views. Students who attend religiously affiliated college, uh, colleges experience less change than those who study at non-religious institutions, although they too come out more skeptical about supernaturalism. Taken together, these social scientific studies prompt me to offer, in the spirit of Bill Sewell, the following social theoretical proposition. The more one knows about the world, the less inclined one is to ascribe to supernatural authority whatever value one finds in the teaching and social function of Protestant and Catholic churches, and the less inclined one is to invoke supernatural authority as a warrant for whatever specifically worldly conduct one advocates. I phrase the proposition in this way, a variation on the central claim of the classic secularization theorists, in order to take account the relatively worldly understandings of churches and ethical principles displayed by so many of the professing Protestants and Catholics surveyed by the researchers I have been citing. The story of American Christianity is not only one of the eventual and gradual migration of a substantial minority into either indifference or principled rejection, that story is also one of increasing historicization on the part of the remaining faithful accepting churches for their social and psychological value. <clears throat> Christianity's American faith is also to a story to be sure of the adamant defense of supernatural authority for certain rules of conduct on the part of a segment of the population most protected from or resistant to natural scientific knowledge, historical knowledge and social scientific knowledge. Comparative studies of evangelical and ecumenical congregations in a single geographic region confirm the sense that types of education make a difference. In one study of churches in the Pacific Northwest, James K. Wellman Jr. found that virtually all evangelical leaders had been educated largely at Bible colleges and that even the most learned of the evangelical clergy had gone to conservative seminaries where they received little enlightenment training and were at one with their parishioners in believing that a good life consisted in applying the plain language of scripture to everyday life. The parishioners in both congregations in this study <clears throat> were more highly educated than the national average, 
but 41% of the ecumenical churchgoers had completed a graduate degree, while only 16% of the, of the evangelicals had. This Wellman study was consistent with many others showing that evangelicals have established a set of parallel educational as well as philanthropic and entertainment institutions that effectively diminish the contact the faithful have not only with secularists but with liberal Christians. Other studies, while not distinguishing between kinds of colleges, do provide some valuable information about educational differences and their relation to the contingencies of Christian commitment. The American Religious Identification Survey, led by Barry A. Cosman and Ariella Kazar, found in 2001 that 72% of Unitarians at the theologically liberal extreme had college degrees, followed by Episcopalians with 56%, Presbyterians with 51 while at the opposite far evangelical extreme, Seventh-day Adventists had 29% college graduates, Assembly of God 24%, Baptist 22%, Pentecostal 16%, Church of God 15%, Jehovah's Witnesses 12 The same study <clears throat> revealed that SAT scores, which are said to inevitably affect knowledge as well as uh, ability. Uh, uh, is that more funny than I thought? Well, anyway, okay. I guess a lot of you are parents who are kept tracking these things very closely. The same study that revealed that SAT scores, uh, they, that the super liberal Unitarians and the Quakers are way ahead of all the evangelical groups with high SAT scores in their children, and also the Episcopalians do pretty well, and uh, the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans and the Presbyterians. Now to be sure, these figures reflect class position, but religious orientation, education, and class position are often connected. Putnam and Campbell found that the Americans with an annual household income of more than 100,000, 100, households with more than 100,000 a year income scored the lowest of any income group in religious intensity, while household incomes with less than 30,000 scored the highest. Putnam and Campbell also found that three quarters of the population they count as the most religious reject evolution altogether and believe that God created human beings less than 10,000 years ago. A number of studies confirm the widespread understanding that the actual practice of scientific and scholarly inquiry promotes a secular orientation, or at least attracts men and women who are secular to begin with. There's also evidence <clears throat> that advanced education in certain fields rather than others is more likely to promote a secular outlook. A credible survey of academics in 1989 found that professors in the more technical applied fields were considerably more likely to report religious belief than professors in disciplines given to more theoretical knowledge. In response to the question, what is your religion? Those saying none were the least common in dentistry, library science, nursing, civil engineering, and social work, while the highest percentages for those willing to say they had no religion were in anthropology, philosophy, and zoology. A 2005 study of the social science faculties at the 21 most highly ranked universities in the United States found that more than half of the social scientists had no religious affiliation, and even those describing themselves as spiritual was much, much smaller than in surveys of the general population. A 1998 survey of elite scientists, those elected to the National Academy of Sciences, found that 65% of the responding biologists and 79% of the physical scientists professed outright atheism, and that the bulk of the others preferred to call themselves agnostics. Only 5% of the responding biologists elected to the National Academy were willing to profess belief in God. These findings, these recent findings, are consistent with earlier studies most notably the widely disseminated studies of James Luba in the early decades of the 20th century, who found leading scientists to be the most free-thinking of all occupational groups. Luba determined that in 1914, 28% of National Academy scientists professed a belief in God, and that by 1933, only 15% did. A later study modeled on Luba's found that 8% did in 1998. Now, Luba's studies fall well short of the highest standards of survey research, but their numbers are sufficiently extreme to warrant attention in a society where more than 90% of the public, even in recent years, assures survey researchers 
that they are theists. But contemporary survey data <clears throat> are far from our only points of access to the relationship between knowledge and Christianity, far from the only supports for my effort at social theory. Differences in knowledge have long distinguished modernists from fundamentalists. Our extensive literature on the reception of Darwinian science and the higher criticism is unambiguous about the liberalizing effect of knowledge. Elisha Kaufman's recent book on the history of the magazine, The Christian Century, leaves no doubt that the farther the ecumenical Protestant leadership traveled in the direction of modern secular learning, the greater the gap between them and the less educated but more orthodox Protestants who gathered around the more conservative Christianity today <clears throat> after being founded by Billy Graham and the right-wing oil magnate Howard Pugh in 1956. This slide actually has uh, a number of the, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was a regular contributor to Christianity Today, and these are three of his attacks on liberal Protestants that were published by Christianity Today. The social scientists have historically displayed an even lower level of religious engagement than natural scientists. This was a finding made by Robert Wuthno in his classic book of 1988, The Restructuring of American Religion. Scientific and social scientific meaning systems will know observed, Wuthno observed, appear to operate as functional alternatives to traditional religious ideas. The churches were deeply affected, of course, by the <clears throat> foreign missionary project, as I described on Monday, uh, bringing, uh, uh, brought into the, 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 the uh, midst of Americans a lot of increasingly sympathetic accounts of ostensibly heathen peoples, returning missionaries coming back and insisting that uh, if you really got to know these folks abroad, uh, it showed how parochial the Methodists and Presbyterians and Lutherans, Lutherans were at the sending uh, co congregations. Actual knowledge, <clears throat> actual knowledge of the Chinese, actual knowledge of the Indians, actual knowledge of the Japanese had a dramatically liberalizing effect on those who absorbed it, resulting in conflicts within the churches that were even more severe than those over evolution. The American intelligentsia's social knowledge of cultural diversity was powerfully advanced by contact with Jewish professors and their non-academic counterparts in literature, the arts, and political movements in the middle decades of the 20th century. The coming of the Jewish intellectuals was, was important to begin with simply because these non-Christians brought American intellectuals of Protestant background into intimate, sustained and institutionalized contact with people who demonstrated on a daily basis that life's deepest challenges could be addressed beyond the frame provided by Protestant Christianity even in its most liberal forms. In that respect, the impact of the Jewish intellectuals on American academia paralleled the, the impact of the missionary project on the churches themselves. The expansion of social knowledge Major, made a great difference in each of these two instances, neither of which have been sufficiently analyzed by historians. But an additional peculiarity of the Jewish intellectuals <clears throat> was equally consequential. Many of the Jewish intellectuals were avowedly secular in orientation, not adherents of Judaism. They, they were more conspicuous than post-Protestant secularists like John Dewey as carriers of the mainstream intellectual, European intellectual life that now leads theorists like Peter Berger to characterize the American intelligentsia as Europeanized, a somewhat loaded term by Berger, which makes sense only when it's applied to the coming of the Jewish intellectuals, uh, as if there was something less than American about Theodore Parker and John Dewey. If the fate of Christianity of the United States can be illuminated, as I've been arguing here, by the standard tools of secularization theory, it does not follow that knowledge operated as an autonomous force without the agency of individuals and groups who helped make that knowledge and who believed society would be better off if instructed more by it than by traditional Christianity and its ecclesiastical leaders. Yes, the more one knows about the world, the less inclined one is to ascribe to supernatural authority one's ethical values and whatever value one finds in the teaching and social functions of the church. But knowing, knowing does not occur in a social and political vacuum. If there was no warfare between science and religion, as scholars nowadays never tire of assuring us, 
there was most definitely a series of struggles between contesting parties over what standards of cognitive plausibility should apply. Even in the great conceptual revolutions achieved in the 19th century by Darwinian science and the higher criticism, even those were, though they were advanced, those great conceptual revolutions were advanced by groups of intellectuals determined to either diminish the authority of Christianity or to revise it so that it would be less obstructive. As the Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith <clears throat> has emphasized in a recent retelling of the secularization saga of the American intellectual elite, the liberal and modernist American Protestants were not in calm waters throwing traditional orthodoxy overboard for the fun of it. Rather, they were trying to lighten the boat's load to see if they could somehow keep it afloat amid the gales blowing at them from the domains of a small but active, highly articulate minority of science-centered intellectuals. Yet a curiosity of Smith's generally accurate account <clears throat> in this book, The Secular Revolution, um, is his bracketing of the appeal of the power of scientific knowledge to begin with. He focuses on how pro-science intellectuals contended with varieties of faith-affirming contemporaries, and he makes clear that traditional Protestantism had some features that few today would be eager to defend, yet he treats science more as a tool of anti-religious reformers than as an enterprise that won the loyalty of these reformers in the first place and engendered their discomfort with the kinds of Christianity they saw as a barrier to science's progress and its socially beneficial effects. This is a common omission in studies written by Christian survivalists. Another example is the attack on secularization theory made by the University of Iowa historian Jeffrey Cox, no relation to Harvey Cox, who sees de-Christianization as advanced by a critical mass of secular intellectuals, but he offers no explanation for why they became committed to secular outlooks to begin with. These conflicts of the 19th and 20th centuries and the historic developments that produced them, while confronted in a fashion by Christian Smith, are largely ignored <clears throat> in a work that demands our attention here because it is the most widely discussed study of secularization in our time. This is Charles Taylor's The Secular Age. What most distinguishes this book <clears throat> is Taylor's insistence on the unique importance of a conceptual shift he dates at approximately 1500, long before industrialization, urbanization, the enlightenment, modern science, literacy, and the spread of democratic political institutions. It was at that very early modern moment, according to Taylor, that for the first time, in the Christian West, religious belief became an option rather than an axiom of life full stop. This new condition of belief defines the secular age right down to the present. Taylor reviews briefly the intellectual history of the 19th and 20th century, but he sees little reason to dwell on that period because the crucial step in making our world secular was long since taken. If Taylor is correct, the fate of Christianity in the United States is of relatively minor importance, working itself out within a frame established about three centuries before the federal constitution ordained a political order in which religious faith was most definitely a matter of choice. Why have so many historians <clears throat> found this book more of a distraction than a source of insight? That, ordin that ordinary inhabitants of Europe prior to 1500 were incapable of non-belief is far from established as a historical fact. As John Butler has pointed out, medieval Christians knew that faith was not axiomatic if only because so many needed to be killed to make it so. <laughs> Taylor elides the church's necessary resort to force and authority to sustain Christian belief in the centuries before 1500, Butler observes, and only occasionally does Taylor acknowledge just how physically dangerous religious doubt, much less unbelief, could be long before and long after that date. Opportunities for choice, of which Taylor makes so much, are indeed central to the recent history of the North Atlantic West. But those opportunities were greatly promoted by the industrial, urban, and scientific events to which Taylor scarcely attends. The cacophony of diverse religious voices even in 18th century British America, Butler shows, 
did much to undermine any and all particular claims to a single religious truth. <clears throat> Taylor's claims about history are indissolubly bound up with his pervasive philosophical, theological, and social psychological affirmations of an enduring human need for a connection to something transcendent. Although modern intellectual life includes many voices insisting that this just ain't so, Taylor blithely treats all such denials as simply naive. The many non-historian readers who have made Taylor's book a basic text for discussions of secularization seem not to be bothered by this all-defining feature of a secular age. But historians, <clears throat> Peter Gordon, Martin Jay, Jonathan Sheehan, as well as Butler, among others, have explained at copious length why historians look for evidence where Taylor, time after time, offers sage-like wisdom and personal confession and avoids honest engagement with alternatives to transcendence. Although saturated with bits and pieces of history and sweeping claims about huge chronologically marked transformations, a secular age is written in such a voice as to render it, in Sheehan's words, inoculated against historical critique. Harvard's Peter Gordon complains <clears throat> that Taylor treats as the core of modern selfhood what is chiefly a prejudicial and arguably inaccurate model common to a certain class of philosophers. Taylor's critique of naturalism, Gordon continues, simply fails to deal with the historic reality of the existence of highly developed naturalist thinking that does not fall victim to the arrogance and parochialism Taylor ascribes to it. Gordon further complains that Taylor pays scant attention to the muddled majority in the United States who are not strict theorists or strict atheists. Many Americans are comfortable with an ironist's faith. They are no longer at ease with full dress garments of firm traditional Christian commitment, but they are reluctant to cast them altogether aside. They participate simultaneously in believing and not believing, aware on some level that the beliefs they do hold are both historically and psychologically contingent. Voicing a, sp a perspective not unlike that of Putnam and Campbell, Gordon allows, that we're going to talk, if we're going to talk about today's modes of believing, one might regard as the most typical religious sentiments among 21st century moderns, not those who believe or don't believe, exercising Taylor's great choice, but rather those who live with a sense of muddle. There may indeed be a bit of muddle in the middle, attention to all the things that have happened and continue to happen in that expanse between orthodoxy and the varieties of irreligion might enable the secularization debates to move more decisively from the either or, belief, non-belief, religious, secular set of dichotomies to a concentration instead on the dynamics of change even when that change falls short of manifest indifference or avowed secularism. The tools of secularization theory are underutilized when applied only to a finished product called the secular. Are we to, to conclude then, <clears throat> are we to conclude that the American fate of Christianity is keyed by a dynamic of internal secularization by which the most otherworldly forms of the old faith are gradually and episodically abandoned by the majority of professing Christians, even while doggedly defended by a vocal minority increasingly driven by politics? I believe this is indeed a major aspect of Christianity's American fate, but whether internal secularization is the best term for it is not so clear. Perhaps the scholar's voice can be too easily confused with the polemics of religious conservatives who regularly castigate liberals as having sold out the faith for secular modernity, or at least as having made of themselves a slippery slope by which a community's Christian birthright is forsaken. Earlier in this lecture, without polemical intent, I presented William James, Rhino Niebuhr, and Harvey Cox as secularizers of a certain kind. I wonder if that was the right term. At the very least, a distinction should be made between those Americans who consciously reject Christianity or simply become indifferent to it, the real secularists, perhaps, and those people who affirm Christianity but do so on terms that, had such terms been the defining ones at the time, might not have generated the whole inquiry into the secularization of Christianity in the North Atlantic West to begin with. It was the otherworldliness, after all, in particular ascribing to supernatural powers the authority for behaving in the world in certain ways and not others. It was the otherworldliness of Christianity in its various forms that made it worth identifying and measuring. 
Would the concerns about the distinction between the Christian and the secular that informed the Peace of Augsburg, the French Revolution, the American Bill of Rights, the writings of Max Weber, been what they were if the operative model for the Christian at those times would have been what we find, for example, in the case of the prominent Catholic writer of our own time, James Carroll. Carroll wrote Practicing Catholic <clears throat> in 2009, par partly to answer charges that his extreme liberalism on a large expanse of doctrinal and political issues rendered him not really a Catholic at all, but a secularist pretending to be a Catholic. To this, the former priest responded with a ringing vindication of the reforms of Vatican II, a testimony that he had found that he could not become a true Catholic except by leaving the priesthood, which was still affected by so many pre-Vatican II ideas and practices. And he responded also with a declaration of Catholic loyalty couched in terms of decidedly historicist understandings of his church and persistently pluralistic conceptions of the American social and political order. Ultimately, Carroll justified the Catholic Church not because supernatural power ordains it, but because we, we cannot live without it. It is not then just a matter of obedience to God, but a matter of assessing human capabilities in a historical context, achieving a satisfactory spiritual orientation given one's circumstances. Speaking for liberal Catholics like himself, Carroll appreciated the church because it gives us a language with which to speak of God, a meaning that is God and keeps the story of Jesus alive. Rejecting with a vengeance the tradition of Catholic sectarianism, especially its refusal to recognize Protestants as part of the true church, Carroll affirmed our communion with all the baptized. Are we scholars to say of Carroll and his many ecumenical Protestant counterparts that they are not really Christian, or that they often serve as stepping stones toward the post-Christian? I believe we can say the second without pronouncing on the first, and that we can say the second while recognizing in the non-teleological mode of historians that a number of people will not be taking the additional steps in a post-Christian direction, but are quite happy to stay where they are. A historicist approach to the study of Christianity and its American fate can interpret people like Carroll, Cox, Niebuhr, and James as artifacts of honest struggles to employ the resources of the Christian tradition while accommodating the best historical, social, and natural scientific knowledge of their own epics. It need not be the business of the scholar to protect liberal Christians from the attacks of their more conservative rivals. We must tell history as we find it. But just how we do we find it? Do we find that the only parts of the United States today that can be fairly mobilized to refute secularization theory are the 20% that Putnam and Campbell call intensely religious? If so, the United States does, enjoy, does indeed join the secularized nations of the industrialized North Atlantic West, and the classic secularization theorists like Steve Bruce are more deeply right than they ever dreamed. And are not these intensely religious folks? The ones, we, the ones who define the public face of evangelical Protestantism are these, these not the people who display the traits that scholars have been most concerned to measure because these traits are potentially in tension with worldly sources of authority. If Christianity in 1500 or 1700 or 1900 would have resembled James Carroll's faith, would there have been such a fuss about setting its boundaries and charting its persistence? The conclusion I have been dancing around here, the conclusion that in the American case, for the purposes of scholarship, only the 20% are truly Christian, would be in keeping with classical secularization theory's tendency to draw a sharp line between Christianity and the lack of it, between the religious and the secular. But such a conclusion would drag that portentous line raspingly across the backs of millions of professing Christians in order to mark the kind of Christianity secularization theory is the most equipped to address. So dragging that line across, uh, dragging that line that way, risks are coming across as accusing liberal Catholics and ecumenical Protestants of having watered down versions of their faith. I think we're better off designing our social theoretical hypotheses and our historical interpretations in terms that recognize spectra rather than sharp lines 
and that particularize our inquiries in ways that put more distance between our scholarly practice and the debates within faith communities as to what is and what is not authentically religious. Hence my attraction and my capacity as an ersatz social theorist to refinements that refer to cultural programs rather than to religions that specify what is being measured, refinements exemplified by the proposition I enunciated above, the more one knows about the world, the less inclined one is to ascribe to supernatural authority whatever value one finds in the teaching and social functions of Protestant and Catholic churches, and the less inclined one is to invoke supernatural authority as a warrant for whatever specifically worldly conduct one advocates. Like all generalizations of that scope, there are many exceptions to it. Some of the most learned men and women in the world affirm supernatural authority in that mode. But history and social science, while recognizing particular cases, cannot be held, held in thrall by them. Overall, Christianity's American faith confirms this general flame, just this general claim, and offers it, offers it as a, uh, offers it to social theorists as uh, something that might be applied uh, elsewhere. It occurs to me that I've talked a lot about the uh, slippery slope, and maybe I should conclude by, <clears throat> uh, by saying that when I was a small child in Idaho, <clears throat> um, my mother uh, allowed me to play with a kid across the street who was a Catholic. And uh, <clears throat> the church ladies, uh, my mother told me many years later, were very concerned about this. The church ladies took my mother aside and said, listen, if you allow David to play with this Catholic you know, he'll fall in among bad companions and so on. She was very proud of her liberalism to allow her son to play with these Catholics and stuff. But you know, I think about the church ladies often because when I grew up, uh, I became an atheist. I married a Jew. Uh, my daughter is gay and my son married an Episcopalian. <clears throat> so uh, if you leave your natal community, anything can happen. Uh, I'll respond as best I can to any comments or questions, uh, any observations. <clears throat>